going to talk today a little bit about background and commentary, so I'll give a little bit of that. Um, we will have a little bit of a Q&A throughout, so we want this to be interactive. You can stop us at any time. We are here to answer your questions specific to how we look at these technologies and think about how we build them into the product and their use cases. And then um, you know, we might have some surveys throughout. But so let's talk about, you know, we think about our perspective. Um, one of the things uh, that's important about this is we do have a perspective. Each of you have seen it, you know, throughout the, the couple days. Some of you as uh, clients, you see how we innovate product, uh, but may not know the behind the scenes. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. Um, part of it is certainly listening and acting what our, what our clients tell us they want. So we do have a vision for where we want to take things. A lot of that is driven uh, by uh, Mahi, as you can imagine, as he's a product engineer and the visionary of our company, uh, but also a massive amount of what winds up in the platform is listening to clients. And that's a really big piece, and I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70% of everything that we put inside the platform at some point has come from a client. So there are several mechanisms that, that, that we do to, to generate that conversation. Um, also, part of it is looking at your business. Each of you operate in, whether you are categorized by one sort of industrial vertical, you actually all operate in multiple business verticals. And so we look at those verticals and say, how do we build a platform, a system, a product, a feature that is going to serve multiple configurations? Because the bad word here, the bad word of the day, and has been for a while, is customization. Nobody wants to live on a customized SaaS platform anymore because what it means is you're isolated from the future innovation of that platform. So keeping you in line with what we are doing and all of our other clients are doing that doesn't mean we don't do the one-off. Some of you are part of beta programs. You test with us. You help us build product. But eventually that makes it into the, the wider ecosystem. Uh, and that brings us to adoption and scale of those things, right? So everything that we think about, and you saw a bunch of stuff today. I saw Mahi on the way down here. He said, Cliff, how did this morning go? And I sort of gave him some feedback. It's all really positive. What I heard, been about eight different client meetings today, tons of positive feedback. But the one consistent feedback was, that's a lot of shit. <laughs> like, how are we even thinking about rolling this out when we're, and I've heard this from other clients, like we are, you know, eight steps behind right now, we're going through this transformational process. Our view on this is a little bit different. It's not that you have to pick the ball up right now and run with it. It's when you are ready. That's that change management piece. It's waiting for you when you are ready. And you will know when your organization is ready to build uh, and implement these things you know, that, that we're offering. So always know that we're, our goal is to be way ahead of that curve. Um, speaking of curves, uh, I thought this was a really fun graphic, just uh, you know, put it up there. It, this came from, I think Bill Gates put this together, that's right, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's just a timeline of technology. And I, and I highlighted, and you can start all the way back from sort of the beginning of recorded time, you know, to where we are right now. Where we are right now, you look at some of the bigger technologies that have been introduced, certainly mRNA, not a political statement, was a breakthrough in terms of vaccines. It was actually an enormous breakthrough technologically. But where's that gonna take us? And, and maybe not my lifetime, but as we, my kids' lifetime for sure, um, will we see human level artificial intelligence? That's gonna be a question for this gentleman right over here. Um, I'm not gonna put them on the spot and ask it, uh, but, but we're thinking about the speed at which technology is advancing. And that's really what this chart is saying, where we took you know, a million or 100,000 or, you know, 50,000 years to do something. Now, in a span of um, just a few years, a decade or less, we are significantly advancing technology in different ways. But we're doing it in different venues, different avenues. And part of the problem that we've run into is um, industries that are highly regulated, government uh, regulation cannot technologically advance as fast as some others. And, and you know, you think about um, you know, any of this hardware, you know, cars, TVs, house furnishings, all of those where technology can play have become cheaper, it has become more abundant. Mahi talked about farming. It's a really good study that says pre-1890, 94% of the world was involved in agriculture as a job or as a means of survival. And today it's less than 2% of the world is involved in our agriculture. Yet, for the most part, we have an overabundance of food around the world. A distribution of food is a different thing. Um, so we think about those things. And if we look at 
you know, just the, some adoption numbers in terms of, of uh, the, the time it took to get to a million users, million daily users, you know, with Netflix at 41 months, Twitter 24, Facebook 10, Instagram 2.5, and, and chat GPT was five days. They are currently at somewhere, give or take, around 250 million daily users, which is an unheard of number. It's not even six months old in terms of its public release. Now, what people also don't realize is that ChatGPT has actually been around since 2014. So it's, it's just taken a while to mature and be released publicly. But when it was, it just grew wildly. Um, but there is this liability of learning in all of this technology. And it goes into two places. The first is the, um, th with human beings themselves. How do we use these tools in ways that, that are um, you know, providing a, a level of risk management for some of these tools that we have to be careful of their output. ChatGPT is no different. Um, but there's a learning liability of the technology itself. It's only as good as the data that the modeling is built on. I just did um, a quick interview with our director of communications and talking about this, where some of the data that these systems are using are actually it's public data, and or, or I'm sorry, it's it's publicly available data, but has been uh, cited by someone who created the work, but is being used in the modeling. So there's a question about does that meet a regulatory standard uh, if you're using someone's you know cited work and then creating a derivative work from it. There's a big question mark about that. So, and so we think about all of those things, and we, and we think about how can we teach these tools in a narrow focus about what we want them to do. If we talk, look at the job description generator that we had upstairs, that's a really good use case, and one that maybe legal and compliance could look at and say, because we can measure exactly what it's doing, you're kind of safe to use it. But the broader use of generative AI, maybe we're not ready for it to open up that can of worms. We have to be very, very careful how we do that. So we are moving from a, a society of content creators to content curators. That's really where all of this is going. No longer um, will we be sitting down and as in mass, you know, having to create lots of content. So these tools are really good at helping us curate content to make it more bespoke and personal, do all the things that you saw it do. What, what is really good, look, I'm a musician, my wife is a fine oil painter, um, and we will always still be around creating what we create, but for the lay person doing their job, like what Mahi was talking about this morning, in terms of creating a job description, if you're not really good at writing or assessing and doing research on a job description, you're spending 20, 30 hours just to get it right on one job. Some of you here right now have 30, 40, 50,000 open roles. Imagine having to write, have a person be that precise, that compliant, that inclusive in everything that they produce. At scale, it, that's where it gets wildly out of control. So content curation with these tools is really important. But how do we make that leap? Like this is what we're gonna talk about today. How do we actually bring this into the fold, and start talking about some of these use cases? One of the things that we think about is if you can't explain it simply, you don't really understand it well enough. And this holds true today as it did in Einstein's time when he said it. And we think of some of the, the, the attributes that we look at being responsible, defensible, um, configurable, and it's certainly explainable when it comes to things like New York 144, the local law there around AI bias, or EU AI. These are important regulations that aren't fully uh, implementable at this point, but they're there and we have to figure it out together, much like we did GDPR in May of 2018. Right, so they weren't that mature, but they, they're, they're actually really good laws that, that give us a good direction. When we look at the hype versus reality, there's really one thing, there's all these reasons why technology typically doesn't work, but it comes down to really this, this last one, which is we think of it as an acquisition versus adoption. And so I hope you know, how we started this conversation was you saw a massive amount of stuff this morning. Right? Our expectation isn't that you're going back to your organizations and turning it all on tomorrow morning, because right, as Ryan last said, that I agree with you, that would be an absolute nightmare. Right? But in terms of the mentality of adoption, those that are our clients right, understand that it is a crawl, walk, run process. And it's different in, at different stages and different speeds for every client, every organization, every team, and every person. And we need to consider that, but the mindset of I'm adopting this technology and we're gonna find a way to do it responsibly is different than I just bought something turned on, right? 
So with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Venkat, Great. and he's going to take you through it. Thank you. Thanks also. Real quick question. How did you enjoy your uh, product day so far? Everybody liked it? Great. So very simple question to begin with. What is GPT? Generative pre-trained transformative, transformative models. Transformers. Transformers. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so our, in our layman terms, I would just say general purpose tools. That's what OpenAI calls them. Right? That's basically what it is. That's the vision at which, or through which, OpenAI started building these GPTs too. Now we know that GPTs are here. They are going to be pervasive. And in my conversation with Commissioner and Ben Banks yesterday, I told you that it's going to be an existence and a coexistence crisis conversation, right? There are lots of things that are going to coexist with us. Cobots, co-pilots, and really it comes down to one or two things. How are you going to really know which one's real and which one's a deep fake? So if I were to choose a career plan or a succession planning or career pathing for me, you know what? I would probably invent a job category calling GPT or deep fakes the stiffers and start to create an organization for me because we've had that. And that's going to be the next problem that us as a talent community are going to face in the, the next 12 to 18 months. We can't tell which one's right and which one's wrong. If the European Union or Europe in this case is considering of watermarking every single document or image or a video that is artificially generated. So we are going to see some amount of those regulatory pressures transcend here in the United States as well. Um, in 2018, when these GPTs or GANs, generative adversarial networks, were born, or at least were beginning to create a lot of disruption, there was an art in Christie's in 2018 that essentially was sold for 437,000 pounds. This is the newest edition, right? I mean, it took the first part in one of these painting conversations. So work fundamentally has changed. Although my friend tells me that his wife is going to be driving that part of the appointment, but I'm pretty sure it's going to disrupt that as well. Sorry. Yeah. So really important, how do we even tell whether the artificial intelligence that is getting used from day to day is even good or bad? Or does it have trade-offs at some point in time? So this is a very interesting campaign that Be My Eyes created. You guys can all um, refer back to this on openai.open.ai. Um, open and you can see that literally this campaign helped people who are visually impaired and have accessibility issues to start seeing. Just fantastic. You would see that a person goes through her day-to-day -day life and really start asking questions to the AI to have that be transcribed and really drive that human to machine interaction to the deeper level. So has, does anybody, just real quick, I, I, so has anybody heard of Be My Eyes? So, so those of, so I used to be, I still am, you know, a, a, I get a phone call, I used to get a phone call, right? And, and you would, someone would be in a store somewhere and they'd say, I'm going to use my phone and tell me what this is. And you would help them. Or if they're somewhere lost or something, they would use their camera. So it's really cool technology just in terms of connecting, you know, the, the visually impaired to those that can help them in an instant. I used to get phone calls at like 2 in the morning sometimes, right? Um, this, and it, this technology is transferred. The phone call is gone. I haven't, I haven't got a phone call in a couple of months, right? which is disappointing to me because I like being called. But, um, but... This is the transformative nature of this, if, you, if you've ever used it. It's a really cool technology, um, and, and it has the ability to really transform that experience from person to person to person to technology. So the, the speed and efficiency with that it's doing it um, is, is real-time versus 
waiting for someone to pick up the phone on the other end. So it changes their life completely. <laughs> Thank you. In my previous life, uh, there were robots which were actually walking down the aisles of Walmart. I don't know if you've been to a Walmart store, but it was essentially planner robots which were walking down the aisles and it was really counting the inventory on the shelves mm -hmm. and getting it back to a cloud center where each of those pixels and data that were created was used to transcribe standard operating procedures for people who were on the back side of the stores to really say what's important. Right? So, so there happens to be a lot of good connections here. Just like, you know, robots are going to be helping or where cobots can be helping. Again, early detection with AI and type 2 diabetes. I'll tell you that um, around 2018, 2019, I actually worked on a product which used to categorize or which essentially helped um, radiologists shrink the time from when an X-ray was taken to when an X-ray screening was available to when a diagnosis was available by eight and a half hours, just from the time you go through an MRI till things were read. Why is that important? For first world countries, it's not so <laughs> important. But when you start to think about the third world countries where accessibility of doctors, physicians are, are sparse, this becomes a huge value add. So there are economies at scale where AI actually helps, and there are things where AI doesn't do really well. So chat GPT gets a movie, right? I mean, there's, there's an interesting article out there that you guys can all read, but literally Bing's chat GPT gets moody and starts really using expletives as they start to talk about the conversations. Father of internet, right? Went, basically, who started the internet revolution, came back and said, do not rush into AI just because ChatGPT is cool. Now, heart of the press, Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, and others have asked to pause development on ChatGPT for the next six months. Is, is everyone aware of that? Did everyone see that headline? So it's, it's a pretty tremendous statement. They're saying slow the roll, <laughs> we're moving a little too fast. So we've all seen job zones and magic loop of the talent ecosystem. But again, this is tremendously important. Automation and intelligence is not going to be a profound impact across all job zones. Intelligence is going to be really impacting the job zone four and five. What is important is how does ChatGPT actually transform work? You can see Jobs on 4 and Jobs on 5, I would think, in the yellow and deep red, Ilya, right? Yes, and you can see around the 50th percentile mark. What it tells you is in about, in the next foreseeable future, you're gonna see most of Jobs on 4 and Jobs on 5 tasks that will get automated. Why is this important? Because the automation of skills, the automation of tasks is going to drive one, of course, your productivity, <laughs> but from an economics of labor, it's going to give you an opportunity to see which of your talent pool needs what skills at what point in time and start driving those succession planning, career pathing opportunities within internal employees and also start thinking about how best can we look at this talent pool to bring in from outside that will be essentially your edge going forward, critical, right? This is not research done by FINA, but it is essentially research done by OpenAI themselves. This is from their research paper. Now comes, I mean, you've seen this, but this is, this is kind of interesting, right? Math teachers protest against calculator use. That was about 100 years back. Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak is, is trying to say the same thing. Can we contain the explosion of open AI? Perhaps not. Right? So Elon's statement, yep. what, what did that do to the 
to the blood pressure of Cena. Did, did I think it didn't impact Nothing, because he, here's really what he's saying. He's saying, in its current state, let's stop. Let's figure out these use cases. A bunch of companies that are using you know, generative AI, ChatGPT, and for those that don't know, you know Elon it was one of the founders of OpenAI, right? So like, this is a pretty big statement. So he's not saying don't use it. He's saying, let's just pause right now. Let's figure out the actual viable use cases that we can have for this technology. Learn from that and then continue on. So it's just, just slow down is what he's saying. It's getting too, it can't become that ubiquitous that fast without creating massive problems. So, and we don't know what the problems are going to be yet. So I think, I think this is extremely important. If you remember, we've gone through these hyper pandemics, right? We just went through an epidemic, right? Started in 2020 for COVID. We didn't know when things are going to go viral. And I believe there is a sense of urgency. The rate of pace of change that you're going to see in an S-curve is probably getting closer. And that's where I think some of these alarm bells are going on, right? Are we, at going, are we going to go viral? That's the question. And I believe some of the leaders, some of the, the leaders who are actually foreseeing the future are saying, why don't we slow down and really understand how we can self-regulate this and make sure that this is socially responsible. Right? So real quick, we saw this. This is a Gartner hype cycle. Everybody's seen it, I'm pretty sure. In 2018, there's not, no mention of generative AI. Important. Um, this is 2022. Here's, here's why this is important. And I think, Ryan, your question was like, OK, well, what does it do to the blood pressure? So we've, been, we've, we've done generative AI for over two and a half years, right? The birds and other transformers are, are part of it. But we actually have seen, and the green boxes that you see on the hype cycle are things that we have put in place. And now they are in production that all of you as customers are being, to, are being able to enjoy the fruits of it. Similarly, the blue boxes essentially tells you that there are things which are on an innovation trigger and we are working consciously on it, and it's extremely important for you all to realize how we really think about each one of these emerging te technologies through our prism, our lens, and how we bring it to the market. Um, I'm going to skip this for operational AI. You guys have seen this before. Phenom ensemble model. This is very, very important, right? I mean, the way in which we operationalize any AI or emerging tech is through foundational layer system, and we go through a specialized model, ending up with context. And you can see on the, on the very left-hand side that we go from location to industry to work zone to user. So we're making it much richer as we start to target it to a user or a team, or in this case, a company. How, does, how do we operationalize essentially any AI model? We start with jobs to be done. We create a design of that solution. We enrich the solution and we conclude. There is a bunch of work that we do. We look for data availability, user experience. We construct our AI models, customer impact, and we go through the feedback loop with human in the loop and then get to a solution that we validate with our customers. That's essentially the flywheel through which we operationalize each and every feature. What you're seeing today on the product, or what you saw today on the product roadmap, will go through a very similar flywheel. That's why, to this point, don't turn everything on, because we don't know how that's all going to work together. AI and TA maturity levels, I mean, you know, this is just an eye chart, but I just wanted to flash it out there that there is a lot of AI touch points across our platform. And each one of these AI have gone through that flywheel and have gone through that hype cycle where we've been judicious about what we bring to the market and what we don't. Coexistence, as I said, cohorts, generative AI, and co pilots are going to stay with us in the near future. Is it a crisis? or is it something common is for us as a society desired? Um, this is, Ilya, you want to you want talk to the job description? I know this is your. Sure, job. yeah. So this is an actual thing that's 
in production and beta something between the two, right? Uh, you may have seen the same video in, uh, in my uh, breakout uh, on the edit of AI yesterday, right? So this is, we're generating a job description on the fly. We're gonna enter some keywords and we're gonna, uh, this is, uh, I think, a marketing composition. We're uh, gonna push a button and there we go. We have a job description. Um, easy enough, but uh, you know, you could, of course, do this going to the chat GPT website. The point is that this is integrated in your CRM. This is your workflow. This is tagged with the metadata that you need for your job categories and departments and you know, whatever else. Uh, this is a, a, a work aim. Is it going to slow you down? Probably not. You don't want to use it if you don't want. It. But it's there for you if you choose to use it. Which is the fifty thousand job descriptions that you're talking about? Could be, and I mean, this is a problem. We, you know, we talked yesterday with the, the commissioner, but it's just been. And I think with, you know, I talked to Ryan and Mitch, and said, you know, Eric, we've had this conversation around. You know, the this is a ubiquitous problem, right? Everyone has poorly written, poorly contextualized job descriptions. We picked this use case because, I, in, in at least in our belief, this is such an easy lift for this technology. It's reliable, it's precise, uh, it can learn your voice. And the, the piece here that I think is really important when we talk about that learning liability, understanding the way that your organization views its work. How inclusive do you want those job descriptions to be? Um, which is probably a lot. Um, what kind of keywords do you want to make sure is out there so that SEO is picking up? People aren't examining this. This is the difference in these, these sort of micro use cases but the benefit of this, I mean, how long do you think, and, and I'll, I'll point you right to some looking right at you, Eric. Um, uh, how long do you think it takes to actually write a job description with all the right words that's fully inclusive, vetted by legal and compliance, and uh, the, able to be published? Give me, Ryan, give me a, how many hours is that? Uh, it, it would take us probably three days to get through the entire process. And so, probably three, and Eric, you, Agree. Yeah. So the last one I did was an executive job description working with executives next call it three. From beginning to end. So and, and effort I would say three days effort, but it's probably more like a week or two or longer, right? In terms of duration, right? So here you have what something you can't get around some process, right? Like somebody's gonna review this before it goes out. But at least you've got the the knowledge that this was created with your model in mind and your voice, your organizational voice. That's a big uplift. You, you take something from three days effort to a minute, three minutes, and then someone can review and go through the process. Not like we, but you know, whatever it is, the effort, again, content creation to content curation. Yes, Ron. So but a lot of people confuse job architecture <laughs> with job description to do, very, do very different things. Um, we are considering going through this mass job architecture project. It's mm -hmm. going to be horrendous. I'm actually voting against it, but you know, I'll least make a decision there. Um, how does something like this play into that? Like, do you, do you need to go through that process first, or do you even need to go through that process at all? With, with something like it, it, in my view, uh, probably not. So. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me let yeah. me take the, the data science approach. Okay. As it this is how the tech guy okay. does that at scale. Um, don't start from scratch. Uh, start by taking an existing framework like ONET, or if you're your EN one's flavor, take ESCO, right? Take your existing jobs, classify them against that framework, which can be done automatically. We have an ONET classification for every job that goes through our system. For instance, if you're sending things to Phenom, you're already getting those classifications, right? And then you can say, oh, here's where the gaps are, right? It's, it, the, the, to me, the most useful way of conceptualizing these models, it's not that they're gonna do your job for you, they're gonna, they're not going to replace you, but they will give you a useful first draft. 
So once you have the first draft of that architecture, you can iterate it, or maybe you realize, well, maybe this exercise isn't worth it. The first draft was enough to point us in a different direction, right? It, that, is that kind of approach. Here's what Mark Langwer did, right? <laughs> right? And I had to say, right, Mark? Mark took a bunch of jobs across subcontinents, which are translated into different languages. And guess what he did? He said, oh, okay, let's, let's just throw it into ChatGPT and see what kind of taxonomy to get out of it. He essentially automated it by just throwing it into a ChatGPT, and you, you start getting clusters of the taxonomy of job descriptions by different languages mapped into job categories. Just as a start, right? Experimentation is all about how we play the but <laughs> right. generating interview questions is another one. So the reason I'm walking all of you through through some of this is these use cases are these use cases are something that Freeform has brought to market for customers like you to use. Here's something that we did not do. Welcome, Benavis. I'm a virtual recruiter assistant. I'm here to help you compete with my process. Answer right. They have the control. I can't do much. Does <laughs> anybody know what tool this was? Use it easy. This is not a human. This is a virtual <laughs> And, and if you guys remember this in the cab, I said that we were just going to play around with Welcome the Federal Capital. I'm Anna, a virtual recruiter assistant. I'm here to help you complete the apply process and answer any questions you might have. To get started, first read through our terms and conditions. And once you're ready to go, click next to continue. Right? This was just a very quick excerpt of us really creating a deep fake like this or a human, human avatar and putting it right besides your job description for somebody to just read it out aloud from an accessibility standpoint. So that's a goodness. The badness is I can actually try and reinforce so much of bias, right, by having the job description now having the face. And the vocal cords and the aspects of how that's being portrayed to the candidates could drive different levels of bias. This is something that we chose not to do yet. Let's move more important yet. Because we don't know where the world's going, right? So it has to go through these use cases. Again, go through those, those filters of being socially responsible before we bring it back in. Why did we build it? I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. So we didn't build it. Because we're trying to go through a process. Uh, we have defined our AI principles. What is it that we aim for when we develop technology? <laughs> we want, first of all, right, you might have heard this one a couple of times, we can help a million people find the right job. That's the social mission of the company, right? That's why we're here. If we're not helping people, then we don't need to be here. Go home. Simple enough. Um, in addition to the overall social mission, we have specific AI guiding principles when we develop technology, right? We want to not create and not reinforce bias. We want to uh, inject human control into whatever experience we create, human in the loop. We want to build technology that is adaptive and, and inclusive and explainable. And those things have definitions, right? Adaptive means that we're thinking about not some perfect, universal, one-size-fits-all approach and evaluation of the system, if you will, but we're thinking about the particular use cases, the particular contexts that would be impacted by the model were it to be developed. Uh, adaptive to, say, jobs in different zones. Frontline hiring is not like knowledge work hiring, and so forth. Right? Inclusive, similarly to thinking about the different work contexts, inclusive of 
people coming from different backgrounds. Uh, how might, uh, uh, this was an example given by uh, Keith Sonderling, the EOC uh, commissioner. If you have a, um, uh, a system that transcribes um, an interview based on somebody's voice, right? How do you handle people with, who, who are speaking but with a speech impediment, right? That's, that's a really challenging question. And I don't know that we've like, nailed that answer, right? But somewhere in the workflow, maybe you need an opt-out experience, something. You need to be able to think in an inclusive kind of way. Uh, you need AI that is explainable. Um, so when you generate whatever prediction, um, you have a way of saying, well, this is why that prediction. Designed with privacy in mind, it goes without saying. Um, so based on those principles, we've developed a governance framework. This governance framework follows uh, some work uh, that was originally done by the government of Singapore for the World Economic Forum. And the, um, it's a framework for generating AI governance. Um, and it asks you to think about whatever it is that you're building in terms of the probability of harm or risk and the severity of that harm, right? If you are using your AI to rank jobs in a certain order on a career site search, then the harm of ranking incorrectly will be that it takes a candidate a little longer to find the right job. It's not a hugely harmful thing. And what is the probability of, of, that you might rank things incorrectly? Well, maybe it's even high. Maybe you're not perfectly efficient in ranking with every search, but ultimately it's not a huge concern, right? And so you can take a use case and you can put it somewhere on the map. Um, and then it turns out that this framework really follows a framework that Google has developed. The, this is a screenshot from Google, but it echoes the same kind of thing about risk assessment. So we do risk assessments. And if uh, appropriate, we put in some kind of a risk mitigation plan for whatever it is that we develop. So what doesn't fail this kind of framework? One example of that is Phenom Fiscal. Phenom Fiscal, if you haven't crossed paths with Fitscore, uh, is a model that predicts what is the probability that some resume would be chosen for an interview by a recruiter or hiring manager for some job. It's not who will be a great employee in this role. It's not who will be hired. It's given that there's a recruiter looking at a resume, what's the probability that they will want to interview this person? That's all it's doing. It's linguistic matching between resume and a job description, right? And so you might have some trade-offs. You might say, um, Okay, well, if you deploy Fitscore in this way, like you um, engage in automated decision making based on Fitscore, and you automatically hire or not hire or grant interview or decline an interview, that could be hard. So we're going to mitigate that. Right? One way to mitigate that is human in the loop. It's all. Uh, it's ultimately the recruiter or the hiring manager that makes the decision. It's not Fitscore. Fitscore is at most providing a recommendation. That's one mitigation. Second mitigation is that Fitscore is using what's called a job appropriate variable. Skills, because skills are critical, other job appropriate uh, title, the quantity of experience that someone has. And another way to mitigate it is you measure the bottom line impact. I don't know if you heard uh, Keith Sonderling's uh, EOC commissioner's comments yesterday, but ultimately the concern is are you legally compliant? Whether you're using AI or you're not using AI, you need to put together an adverse impact evaluation. And what does that evaluation show? We just did this. We just did this and this report is about to be released. I'm telling you the executive summary, we're not going to publish the report to the public. 
If you're a phenom customer, talk to your account manager, talk to your CDM. This is the bottom line on that report. Almost 98% of fifth quarter predictions are showing no adverse impact in gender or in race. It's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. We're pretty happy. Um, really, a real quick on that. Is 100% achievable? Because that's 100% uh, not achievable, right? You expect at least 5% just statistically speaking, yes. right? You keep flipping a coin long enough, you will get a series of heads, right? If you're below 5% adverse impact, you're doing pretty well. Okay, so let, let's close here, right? Yeah. So thank you all for your time. We appreciate your time and thanks for being here. And enjoy your rest of the... Let's go back to that previous slide. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. I'm but not the word. One more button. One more. Uh, I don't know if I can navigate it, but I'll get a button. I'll get you this one. This one. Yes, I'm fine. Smiling, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks.